Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That was our verse from last week. That was our command, right, from last week. How did you do? How did you do last week? Did you find more things in your week to be joyful about? Did you find more ways to express your joy? Were you able to add more worship to your week? Were you able to add more thankfulness to your week? I hope so. Because listen, this is what I think we need to focus on for the rest of the year. Christmas as well, right? Joy to the world. (laughs) This is it. Joy. I'm I'm going to keep beating this drum because I'm not getting any joy from out there, okay? I tell you, I am, I am tired of the outside world. I am depressed from the news. I am let down by politics, and all I see is more anger and more lines being drawn and less people willing to just let it go. Everyone in, in this world is wound up like a, like a pressure cooker. Everyone seems to have really thin skin. Everyone thinks that they, their issue is the one that's the most important. And I'm, I'm just so tired. So the last thing I want to do is come here, come to church, to get, to get more of that. So this should be a, a no arguing zone. This should be a no hate zone. A no divisive zone, no lines drawn, no your side, my side zone. This, all of this, this is God's kingdom. And this should be a place of refuge. Yes, a place of peace. Yes, mercy. Yes, love. Yes, but also joy. Look, I could preach on service, right? And I would love more volunteers. I would love more of you to serve. And you'd hear that and you'd say, yeah, Pastor David, I really want to serve, but you know, I'm, I'm just so busy. Okay. I could preach on giving. We are $17,000 uh, in the red right now. And, and you could hear that and say, yeah, Pastor David, I'd love, I'd love to get, give more, but just Things are so tight right now. I know. But I'm preaching on joy. So, so really all I'm asking you to do is be joyful. Stress less. Give it over to God more. Let things go. Be willing to forgive. And be a person who worships God just a little bit more. Just thanks God a little bit more. Can, can we do that? This should be a, a series that is easily, right, easily applied to our lives. Let's be people who are filled with joy. So this here right now, what we do at church, this should change our lives, right? This should change our lives. It shouldn't just go in one ear and out the other. So we've got to try. We've got to try. I've got a I've got a wedding coming up in October, and I need to wear my khaki suit for it. Uh, The bride is doing fall colors, and the groomsmen, they're all wearing khaki. So here's the thing. My khaki suit is my tightest fitting suit. And uh, before COVID, no problem. Before COVID, I was in shape. I was running more. Um, I stopped running. I was exercising more. I stopped that too. I was on a diet. I was watching what I was eating. I stopped that too. So when I gained 10 pounds this year, I didn't just wake up and say, huh, where did that come from? It wasn't a surprise, okay? Because I chose to let myself go. Didn't I? I made the decision to stop exercising. I made a decision to stop dieting. Those were choices I made. I didn't, I didn't lose my figure, like, you know, misplace it, like you lose your car keys. I, I gave up on it. Likewise, you don't lose your joy. Every day we choose. And some of us choose to focus on our problems. We choose to dwell on the problems. And if we don't have joy, 
That's our choice. Last week, we read from Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul reminds you that joy is a battle for your mind, right? Because there are dark forces in this world and they want to take up real estate in your mind. Darkness wants you to worry. Darkness wants you to complain. Darkness wants you to stress. Darkness wants you to worry about the things, especially the things that you don't have any control over. Darkness doesn't want you to rejoice in the Lord always. Darkness doesn't want you to think about praiseworthy things. Darkness doesn't want you to make a joyful noise. Darkness doesn't want you to thank the Lord before you go to sleep or when you rise. Darkness doesn't want you to speak to one another with psalms and praises. Darkness doesn't want you to have the peace that surpasses all understanding. There is a war going on for your heart and for your soul and darkness would love nothing more than to rob you of your joy. So I decided to get back into shape a month ago, I started running again, and I was running uh, two miles, three days a week, and after a month, I hadn't lost a single pound, and I hurt my back. So I gave up. No, I didn't give up. Instead, I just changed what I was doing. I tried a different approach, because here's the thing, fitness doesn't just happen to you. A healthy lifestyle does not just fall into your lap. Just like I didn't lose my flat stomach, I'm not going to then find my flat stomach. I have to try. Joy is no different. I know things like joy and love, they sound like natural things and that those might be things that I'm owed. That's not true. You are not owed love. Uh, you know, on those reality shows, I'm always hearing people say, I deserve to find love. I deserve to be loved. No, you don't. <laughs> love is not owed to you. Love doesn't just happen. Love doesn't fall into your lap. If I asked a couple that's been married for 50 years, what's the secret to staying in love? I guarantee you, they would not shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know. Believe me. They have an idea. They have an opinion. And I bet you somewhere at the heart of it, there was effort, right? They would say effort, trying. You put the time in, you work at it. Love is a choice and you fight for it. It's the same with joy. Joy is a choice and you fight for it. Okay, but I mean, what if I've had a bad week? right? I can have a bad week, you know? I can't control uh, what happens, and sometimes you have a bad day, you have a bad week, bad things happen. Yeah, that's true. But do you think that means that you're supposed to lose your joy? Isaiah 12 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust, I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. See, I am joyful because of who God is and, and what he's doing in my life, for how he saved me. My joy comes from the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 14 says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Doesn't matter. Bad day, bad week, doesn't matter. The Bible says, I'm blessed no matter what happens. So today we're going to be in James chapter 1. We're going to look at how James describes joy and then what he says about maybe having a bad day and how that might affect our joy. James 1 says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. So he starts right off, like any typical letter, addressing who he's talking to. Who is he talking to? The 12 tribes. 
Right. So who are the 12 tribes? Israel. Right. And it's a very Old Testament sounding way of starting this letter, right? The 12 tribes. Like we haven't really heard them called the 12 tribes since the Old Testament. So, and then he also says the 12 tribes of the diaspora, right? So what is that? Well, again, if we were talking Old Testament, that was the, the scattering. The dispersion is whenever the Jews abandoned their homeland, whenever they feel like a stranger in a strange land, which for them happens a lot. But the book of James is written in the New Testament. So perhaps this has some sort of double meaning, and it does. And we're going to find a little bit of that meaning in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, uh, we see at the beginning, Stephen is a Christian, and he is publicly executed. Yeah, stoned to death. And the Bible says that Saul, who one day becomes Paul, approves of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So Stephen dies and Christians <laughs> scatter, right? They run for their lives. There is a new dispersion. These are Christians now, Jewish Christians, who are snatching up their kids, leaving their homes, and they are on the run. They are on the run for their lives, and they are hoping that this bounty hunter named Saul doesn't find them. So as you can imagine, there's hundreds of these families. They're isolated. They're afraid. They're new Christians, new Christians who should be excited about their faith, people filled with joy, but instead they're on the run, they're worried, they're afraid, persecution. So James writes them a letter, and he says, greetings, right? That first word, greetings, that is the Greek word Cairo. And I'll throw in the definition up there on the screen for you. It means to rejoice, to be glad, to be exceedingly glad, to be well, to thrive. In salutations, hail, and it's used at the beginning of letters to give one a greeting as if as a salute. So it's a glad greeting, right? It's a joyful greeting. These people, the 12 tribes who are lost and alone and, dis and scattered, he sends glad tidings. That's how he starts his letter. He sends joy. Joy for what? What, what? <laughs> what, what do they have to be joyful about? In verse 2, he says, Count it all joy brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. He's trying to encourage these people, and he says, greetings, consider it pure joy when you face trials. Wow. Right? We said last week's verse, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. We said that one, that's hard to follow, right? This one seems harder, doesn't it? Look, I know, I know. You're running for your life, and you're trying to find food and shelter, but consider it all pure joy. You ever been persecuted for your faith? You ever had to scoop up your kids and just leave your home and be on the run? Suddenly me having a bad day or a bad week doesn't seem so bad. Sometimes you just kind of have to step back and gain a little perspective. And that phrase, trials of various kinds, in the Greek, it's the word parasmos. And it means someone's fidelity. It means their integrity. It means their virtue. It means their endurance. So it is truly a trial of various kinds. You ever had a bad week where it tested your integrity or your virtue or your endurance? literally tested all of you. Jesus did. Jesus is last week on earth. It began with a parade into town with everyone shouting for joy, and it ended with him whipped and beaten and nailed to a cross. Now, we don't know the last moments. We don't know if Jesus felt joy. 
But we do know in those last moments that he was still thinking of others. He made provisions for his mother. He forgave the dying man next to him. And for the Christian, as James points out, the joy of God can fill us even if it might not be natural in that moment to feel joy. You know, we have friends at church right now who are walking through cancer, walking with heart issues, feeling the loss of a spouse. And we watch their Christian walk, and we seem to be able to smile and and find joy because we think to ourselves, wow, if they can do it, right? We draw inspiration from them. And then maybe we look at ourselves and we and we think, Why? what's my problem? Certainly there are some very strong people, and we know them. And they've learned to count it as joy, even during the trials of various kinds. You ever wondered how they can do it? Have you ever wondered where they get that strength? James tells us. Verse 3, he says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. My wife and I, uh, we go to the Disney parks a lot. I I used to work for the company. Uh, Before I worked there, um, when I did work at Disneyland, uh, and since then, we, now we don't, obviously, but uh, we still take our kids uh, to the parks. And we'd like to be able to say that we're Disney fans, but we don't like being grouped in with that other group because typically Disney adults love to gripe and complain. You'd think that they would be kids at heart. You'd think that they would be joy-filled people, but you know what their two biggest complaints are? They want lower ticket prices to get into the parks, and they want less crowds in the parks. In other words, they want to make it affordable for everyone, but they want everyone to stay away. (laughs) And I shake my head and I say, it's it's supply and demand. You can't have both. Some things in life are either this or this. You can't have both. What if I asked you a few questions this morning? I wonder how you would respond. Do you want to be a strong person? Do you want to be a strong person? I I think you would answer yes to that. I mean, strong physically, sure, but strong emotionally. I mean, nobody wants to be a weak person. I can't see anybody saying, no, I'd rather be weak. Okay, second question. Are you ready for the trials and hardships that you will face this week? Uh, no. (laughs) No, thank you. I mean, who wants that, right? Do you want to be strong? Yes. Do you want to face trials? No. Guess what? James says you can't have one without the other. They go together. James instructs believers to count it all as joy when you face trouble. He says, he says that, right? Because we typically don't. We don't have joy when we face trials. What we typically do is we complain and then we ask God, please remove the trial right? But James says, no, that's, that's wrong. Don't, don't think about it like that, because then you miss out on an opportunity to grow in Christ. You miss out on an opportunity to become stronger. You miss out on an opportunity to become mature. And what James is describing is basically exactly what happens at the gym. You put your body under stress. You put your body under pain, but as you do it, you work through it and your body begins to adapt and grow and change and it meets the challenges that you put it through. 
The more you work out, the more your body adjusts. You can't have muscles without exercise. We say no pain, no gain, right? That's what James is saying here. The more trouble and trial and difficulty that comes your way, the more opportunity you have to grow and mature. The bottom line is you can't grow stronger if you don't face trials. You want perseverance? You want to be a strong person? James says, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. But nobody prays that. Nobody prays that. Nobody prays, Lord, I want to be closer to you. I want to be a strong person, so send me more trials. Nobody prays that. None of us pray that. We, in fact, we pray for the opposite, right? We pray for the opposite. Most of us pray for an easy life. Most of us pray for a safe life. As parents, as grandparents, we're also building protection around ourselves at the same time that we're building protection around our families. Don't you try to protect your loved ones? You feel like it's your job to protect your family, to keep them safe. I got an alarm for my house, right? I have guard dogs. I've got a machete in my glove box in my car. I've got a gun in my nightstand. I've got GPS on my kids' phones. I lock all the windows. Is that the right thing to do? We think it is. It sounds right. Right? But it is, is it my job to shelter my family? To hide them away? To cover them up with layers and layers and layers of bubble wrap? When I do that, then I'm just teaching them to place their comfort and security into those things, and I'm not preparing them for life. Instead, I should be training them to draw their strength from God, not Dad. Listen, my kids' lives are so safe. My kids' lives are so easy. But according to the book of James, I should be praying for more trials to happen in their lives. Yes, of course, I, I don't want to see them get hurt. It hurts me to see them get hurt. I don't, I don't even want to see them cry. But if I shelter them, what happens? Well, then when they leave my house, they won't be prepared. Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If I want them to hold up and persevere, like James says, if I want them to, to be able to be trained up so that when they are on their own, then they need more trials in their lives, not less. I should be making their lives more open to trials. I shouldn't be making their lives so easy. I shouldn't be making their lives so safe. Plus, wouldn't it be better for them to experience more trials now while they're still at home so that I can be the example and I can help them walk through it, teach them to navigate it? I can't have both, right? I can't have both. I can't have strong kids who lead a safe life. I can't teach my kids to persevere if I only offer them a bubble-wrapped life. You think I'm being too harsh? How many of you remember struggling growing up? And what happened? What happened when we grew up? Then we grew up, right? We grew up and we turned around and we said, not my kids, no, no, no. I don't want my kids to have to go through that. You ever heard somebody say that? Have you ever said that? We shelter them from pain and we shelter them from poverty. But wasn't it the pain and poverty that made you who you are today? Didn't we learn to grow and to appreciate things because of the trials? Yeah, I didn't have a cushy childhood. There was pain, there was hardship. But now, today, I'm not the kind of person that falls apart over little things. 
I don't have thin skin. I'm not easily offended. I can just let things roll off. I can let things go. I can step back and I can see the bigger picture. I get it. Not everyone gets a trophy because it's not about me. I was taught that many hands make light work. It's better when we all work together. Wouldn't I rather raise a child like that? I can't pray for a pain-free life. Not for my kids, not for me. And James tells us why. He says in verse four, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What does that mean? It means the pain has to continue until it's done. It has to work itself out so that you grow to be mature and, as James says, complete. Yeah, I want to be strong. I want to be strong. But at the same time, I also want to be holy. <laughs> I want to be mature. I want to be complete. I want to be lacking in nothing. Right? Nope. Most of us, we want to be rich. Right? My end goal is to be financially sound. Nobody talks about when they retire, they want to be a person of good character. Nobody says that when I retire, I want to be a person of maturity. Now we talk about security and comfort. When I retire, I want to be the man or woman of God that he made me to be. I want to be complete. I want to be like Christ. James says, perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. That's who God wants you to be when you grow up. That's who God wants you to be when you retire. What do you want to be? How do you want to retire? Do you just want to play it safe? Just pray for more bubble wrap? Am I just praying for a hedge of protection around everything? Am I looking down the road of my life and just hoping that I can just have a, a stress-free existence? Who does God want you to be? You know, because God is a parent too, right? God is also a parent. God is your parent. And he is looking down the road at the rest of your life. But rather than seeing a stress-free person, he is trying to build a mature person. He is trying to build a complete person. Have you ever asked God why? You know, you have that bad day. You have that bad week. And you say, why did this happen to me? Why does this always happen to me? The answer is because he wants to make you strong. He is making you complete, making you mature, making sure that you lack in nothing. So, what's the answer? So, count it all as joy, right? Count it all as joy, the good times and the bad. Count it all as joy. The relaxing days on the beach and the stress-filled day at work. Count it all as joy. Blessings and loss. Count it all as joy. The thick, the thin, the good times, and the bad. Count it all as joy. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father God, you are the source of my joy because of who I used to be and who I've become, because of who you have been in my life and who you will always be. 
because I am your child, because I get to be a part of this church, and because I know the place that you have prepared for me. I count it all as joy. Good, bad, blessings, loss, I count it all as joy. Lord, may I learn to begin to see those trials and those stresses in my life for what they are, the lessons that you teach me. As you grow me to be the man or woman of God you would have me be. Thank you for being my loving parent. Thank you for watching over and protecting me. And thank you for not sheltering me against things that which grow, would grow me. Help me to be the parent or grandparent that I need to be, to teach these lessons, to pass them on to my own children and my own grandchildren, that we might raise a strong generation, that we might raise a mature generation, that we might raise a generation who lacks in nothing, lacks in nothing because they have you and they can count it all as joy because they have you. May I learn to find more joy this week. May I learn to lean on you more this week, to fill my lungs with worship, to fill my lips with praise, to be thankful. May I, build, may, may I be joy-filled every day. Amen. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for walking uh, with us through this journey. And uh, hey, coming up this month is October. We're going to have Trunk or Treat on Halloween Day. Halloween Day, that is when we have Trunk or Treat. It's from 5 to 7. It's open to the entire community. Please come, bring your little ones. We got candy. We got a DJ. Uh, the Chick-fil-A truck is going to be there, so come hungry. It's going to be a great night for the community. The other thing I want to let you know is Christmas... That's right, we're, all, we're already talking about Christmas. Christmas is on a Sunday, and that means we will be closed. That'll be a Sunday where we're closed. So we encourage you to come to our Christmas Eve services on the 24th. We'll have two services available for you. We'll also have a Christmas concert available for you. We want to be able to help you ring in the holiday with joy. So please stick around, stay close to our .com, follow us on social media, and I will see you guys next week. Thanks. Bye.